Uh, hi, I'm, I'm, Ru uh, I'm Dr. Rufus Pollock. Uh, I'm a co-founder of the Open Knowledge Foundation uh, and a member of the board. I'm a Shutterworth Foundation Fellow and I'm an Associate Fellow of the Centre for Intellectual Property and Information Law uh, at the University of Cambridge. I mean, I think open science can be quite a broad, can be a, quite a broad term. I mean, specifically, the, the Open Knowledge Foundation has done a lot of work since we started in 2004 in relation to open science, I guess, particularly through knowing Peter Murray Rust, Cameron Nealon, and other people. Uh, and we, we have a working group on open science. But specifically there, I think, I mean, the, the simplest way I, we see it, let's say, the Open Knowledge Foundation is that open science it, it, it's about, it means science where the kind of underlying, the, the information produced, the knowledge produced is, is open and that open in the sense of the open definition which means free for anybody to access, use, reuse and redistribute subject to almost no restriction, the only restriction could be kind of attribution or the requirement to share back if, if you build on that work. So in that way that's the simplest definition, it's really precise, it's very clear so what it means is the papers you produce, the data you produce the data you maybe you work with. Now obviously probably no one in, in that sense is a completely open scientist um, because you know we use some closed data and we create some closed data and we don't always publish, certainly at the moment sadly, in always in open access journals. I mean more broadly the term could, could mean a kind of attitude, a very kind of, uh, sorry, so more broadly it can have a wider connotation in a sense of you know op what's called maybe open notebook science, like you publish everything you're doing all the time almost stream of consciousness onto your blog, um, you know, your, note, your lab notebook is, is on your blog, you know, your, your conjectures, your thoughts, your analysis you did today. I mean, and also I think it can relate to a kind of form of collaboration, you know, being more open to collaboration, more distributed, collaborating in, with wider groups of people, people you don't know so well, it's not just your own lab, but across the world, on the internet, whatever. And I think that last sense is, is kind of, is in some ways quite central. I mean, the reason you're interested in open data or open content is precisely because not, not in itself, it's because sharing information in that way, I mean, A, it's kind of fundamental to the conception science that we build on other people's work, we learn from others, we then give back to the, this, this kind of community, but also to the modern, the modern digital era, that, you know, open data and open information is what enables a much more distributed, collaborative, decentralised model of, of innovation, of perhaps, you know, culture and of research than was possible before, much in the way that we were able to build, have very distributed, you know, peers-based commons production of software, for example. Good. Okay. Um, I mean, sorry, I should ask, in, add one last thing to that, which is that openness also extends, I think, perhaps to a conception of broadening participation in science, in some sense, in, the, in that we, we live in a period where, you know, to be a scientist is a very specific thing, you know, you've got a PhD, you're working in a lab, but one can imagine a world where now, you know, there's no reason why a much broader section of the population, they might not be really hardcore scientists, but why can't they help identify galaxies? Why can't they understand the genome? You know, why, and why can't they do some of their own analysis? There's no reason, you know, just as, you know, some people are, you know, part-time gardeners, you don't have to have some incredible set of professional, professional gardening. There's quite a bit of science that isn't, you know, obviously it's, it requires understanding, but there's quite a bit of it that, that, that there's no reason an intelligent person who doesn't spend all their time doing science couldn't contribute a lot. So I think also that openness of the material is about broadening perhaps the participation in scientific culture and research to, to a wider audience, citizen science as it were. So, I mean, economics, to the extent it's a social science, is, is very similar. It has data, people do research using that data, um, they have models, etc. So, you know, economics, to that degree, is just similar as any other science. I mean, we could call it open social science, if you want. Well, I, I used the term open notebook social science at one point. You know, we could just extend almost all of those conceptions and ideas. I don't really see economics as very different um, in, that, in that regard. Um, and open knowledge, I mean, knowledge is just a catch-all term for information, data, content, in a way. I mean and all the things around it. I mean, sometimes the word knowledge is a bit of a contested term. It doesn't mean deep understanding of the world. But basically, by uh, open science is about open data, open information, open content, about open knowledge. That's, that's the core part of it. I mean, obviously, the most interesting thing is the cultures, modes of practice, how people actually do stuff that is built on top of this fundamental thing of 
the data is open. If the data isn't open, if the content isn't open, most of those other processes don't work. When you talk about opening up the data, mm -hmm. and this is where it for me it crosses over with the more specific to an open mm. notebook science, mm. are you also interested in your own practice in opening up the methodology that you've used? Sure. I mean, is that uh, part of the data for you or is that a separate thing? I mean, I strictly, I don't, it seems to me that open notebook so science is kind of a, a, another step. It's a, a you know, a, open notebook approach says, okay, a, you know, A, having your lab notebook and being, I mean, it seems to me I'm told two things. One, a commitment to greater documentation, um, potentially. I mean, I don't, I don't it seems to vary because, you know, quite a lot of stuff is done in your head or scribbled on bits on paper. Simply getting that into a digital form to share with other people requires extra effort. Um, and secondly, then committing, having done that in digital form, to sharing that openly, i.e., you know, as per the open definition, freedom for anyone to get access to your notebook, use it, reuse it. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that's a really interesting thing, but I w it wouldn't be something I required as part of it. I mean, I don't see why the, the traditional thing, which is I do a bunch of stuff, I might have a load of scribbles in, you know, on paper. The fact that I don't digital, digitize, digi you know, put that into digital form, but the fact is when I write up, when I eventually, you know, I, my experiment is successful or whatever, and I write up the method by which I do it, that part of it should be, you know, open, an open access publication, the data should be open. Um, in general, I think going forward, it's going to become more essential though for the data that was part of the process, I mean, given that we now can automatically record that, that the data that was part of the process of coming to that is probably going to need to be made more available. One, just for kind of what I would call efficiency purposes, we throw away so much data that we've put a lot of time and effort into creating. That's very wasteful, you know, I might not need it, but someone else can. I and mean, it's something I always think about films. You know, when they shoot a film, there's all of this film they shoot that never makes it into the final thing. It seems a bit of a waste. It's not, I mean, in the summer, you know, that, that just gets thrown away. Secondly, in a sense of val validation, it, I think it's already, you know, you're, you're supposed to detail what you did, document what you did, you're supposed to upload data so other people can reproduce, but putting more of it, it will just become easier in a way to just hit the kind of automatic button while you're doing the work rather than have to kind of go through the end and pull it all together. And it will also make sure that it's, you, there's no kind of chopping out all of the, or, you know, the, un, the unhelpful bits that, uh, at the end. So I think that, that, that will become more feasible. I mean, realistically though, for it to happen on a broad scale, we need to make it really easy. I think at the moment, having tried to even do a bit of open notebook social science myself, the problem is at the moment it involves, it involves quite a lot of work because a lot of what you're doing, you know, to just get it on a blog or get it up somewhere is, is actually quite a bit of work. And most people who are busy enough are not going to engage in that effort unless it's, it's really simple. I think the answer, so what kind of benefits are there to me, be it personally or more broadly to the research community? I mean, it must be, sounds like it's a very pro bono publico, kind of, it's very good, but personally, I don't think there have been a lot of benefits as an academic, you know, at the moment, because, um, it, it, you know, it's a very small, still, sadly, it's even though there are these really compelling reasons why we should do it, many of the, in, there's little necessary incentive. So one of the things to point out, about those benefits at the moment is they tend to not accrue directly to you, they accrue to the broader community. They start accruing to me when I get to access to someone else's um, material um, and you know I'm part of a, of a great thing. We've seen that, we've seen that ecosystem develop in software where people now really do open up their stuff because of what they're getting back and because of a need to do so and it's a default within the profession. For me, I mean, I, A, I did my research in economics was around open knowledge and open knowledge production. I was very interested in how, you know, how do we learn? You know, how do we create new technologies? How do we um, you know, create new software? And it seemed, it seemed that this kind of open approach was very, very interesting and quite powerful one. I mean, also in theory, it has been a default. I mean, just to reiterate, the default of publicly funded science, you know, that's why people publish in journals and want people to read their work. You know, they don't make money out of that. They get upfront funded to do that is that approach already. What has happened is that we've slightly got lost in the last 20, 30 years uh, due, due to kind of restrictions that have come in through ownership of journals and other things. Conversely, there's an incredibly new potential due to digital technology for a much, much wider sharing than before. So I think for me, you know, directly, I mean, I really enjoy it. I find it really interesting. It's part of what I research, but from a practical level of why I do it, I think it is because you can just see this promised land. You know, you can see a world in which, you know, why, I don't know, why do I have to get a subscription 
you know, to the British Medical Journal. Why, you know, I was interested in you know, reading habits in ancient Rome. I was interested, you know, how many books got published, or books in quote unquote in ancient Rome. At the moment, you know, even, even when I was an academic, there were a bunch of paywalls I had to kind of go through or work out, or I couldn't get to something because my login didn't work. Then just, just the, e you know, I, I'm just interested in things. Having access to that, be it whether I'm an actual researcher or just a citizen, is really, really important. And just making that easier. And, 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 and the world that we can imagine in which every human being has access to, you know, cutting edge research. You know, also, what could happen? What are the potentialities? What are the tools that could be made? What are the, you know, are discoveries going to be made by, you know, potentially or like insights got by 14 or 50 year olds sitting in their bedroom? You know, that's a really exciting world. It's one that's not really that possible at the moment.